Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. And this week, we'll be looking at some fantastic projects from the Electromaker website. We'll also be looking at some new products that are not quite available for funding on CrowdSupply yet. But yes, one of them is a retro music player that looks like an iPod, but has an ESP32 inside called Tangara. It looks really awesome. Um, and uh, we'll also be looking at how NVIDIA are using generative AI as part of their new robotics stack. So um, if you have an NVIDIA Jetson uh, kit, whether it's a, a Nano or an Orin or uh, which is the one in between called Xavier. Uh, this is stuff that you can get your hands on today and use the same kind of tools that people are using for the bleeding edge of autonomous robotics. Very exciting. And with all of that to get through, let's get on with the show. We're going to start the show by talking about NVIDIA. Uh, now, of course, they're best known for graphics cards, and most of the chat on the internet is about those graphics cards and how hard they were to get for quite a while. Um, but they've also been very busy in the embedded sphere and uh, boards like this. This is the original uh, Jetson Nano, which is the uh, lowest powered, but still pretty powerful, um, Edge AI device. It's a system and module that fits onto a baseboard. And since then, things have somewhat improved. They have the Xavier NX, which is even more powerful, and more recently, the Orin, which is an absolute AI powerhouse. Um, but they haven't just been doing hardware updates. They've been updating their software stack the entire time. And now they've done something quite interesting. Uh, generative AI is the big thing right now. Uh, ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, um, uh, MidJourney is another image uh, creator, and of course Google's Bard, all of these. These are things that can generate data from a very simple prompt. And one of the great things about that is you can use that to generate models for training other AIs. You can make AI training easier using generative AI. And this is what NVIDIA have started putting into their software stack. Now, I'm going to keep this incredibly brief, uh, not because this isn't exciting and doesn't deserve talking about, but because it is so higher above my sphere of understanding that I don't want to say something stupid. Um, so the announcement here essentially is saying that the Isaac Robot op Operating System, which is their version of ROS, um, is available for general release now. You can get it if you have um, a device uh, that it can target, then uh, you can use it. I, I think, uh, I know that a lot of the generative AI stuff is only uh, uh, targeting the Orin now. So my little Jetson Nano here doesn't stand a chance, unfortunately. Um, but yes, uh, you can uh, the robot operating system, which is uh, all the things that robots need, object uh, uh, recognition, depth perception, all of that kind of stuff, and everything they've done in order to improve that kind of perception based on the sensors you have and the compute on board. Um, NVIDIA Metropolis uh, is a really interesting one as well. Now, that's not coming out yet. The expansion on Jetson is coming next. Um, but the uh, yeah, that, that's not something that is released. They're just saying it's going to be. It's a whole set of uh, APIs and microservices, whatever that word means, um, but no, it's lots of little chunks of things you can put together in your code so that you could have a box with a camera attached to it, which is smart enough to uh, ask questions to. A lot of the whole point of this generative AI stuff is that you can attach the sort of uh, back and forth generative AI that we're used to with ChatGPT to something like a camera. So uh, let's say, for example, um, I, I do fully understand why some people are uh, horrified by the idea of smart security cameras, for example. But let's just say that you uh, wanted to track uh, from multiple cameras camera someone wearing a red jumper. Um, the way we're going now is that you could literally type in a text prompt, um, can you tell me when the guy with the red jumper was in each one of these locations? And it'll be able to say, yes, of course. There was a guy uh, on this camera at this time, this camera this time, all guys with red jumpers, and then give the exact timestamp of the footage. Um, now, that's probably a very crude example. There's probably far better examples out there. Um, and there's a lot more to it than this. I mean, uh, again, a, a lot of this targets the idea of smart robotics. This isn't a camera that's stuck on a wall. This is a robot that can go through a factory and, or go through a space, or go through a place with people in it and do various things and that you can interact with in a more uh, meaningful way. Uh, so a perfect example of this, actually. It's things like AI-assisted uh, data annotations. So if you need to annotate data, um, you can now get AI to help you with that. In fact, in the initial video here, um, there's a section of it where you see someone labeling data um, with a car. Yeah, so they're saying, uh, this is the car. They already detect there's a car there, but it's saying, OK, a white car, gray car, black car, SUV, sedan. That is labeling the data in real time using a fairly simple text prompt. Um, which is going to speed things up a lot. And there's a lot more to it than that as well. Um, if you look at the um, generative, uh, sorry, there's an article on generative AI, by the way, which is absolutely fascinating. Again, a little bit over my head. Um, but the bit I'm looking for, 
So just before moving on, I want to quickly talk about the Generative AI Lab, because I think um, there's, there's fantastic tutorials about Generative AI. There's the list of all the models you can download um, and the list of all of the different things like the Tau Toolkit, and we talked a bit about Metropolis already. This, to me, is just a, a, a very simple example about what this all means. Um, if you can deploy a mini version of ChatGPT onto a device and give it an image, and then it will tell you not only that there are three people in the image, but there's someone in the background and the three people in the image are women working in a field. Or, for example, in this other example, with a different large language model, um, giving it an image and it gives you a description of what that image is. To me, it seems very obvious why this is useful in uh, objects that need to see and rely on AI to do so. Um, and the same goes for things like uh, SAM, which uh, is uh, Segment Anything, the tutorial, an AI-assisted segmentation tool. Um, and even things like Stable Diffusion. Uh, it's, uh, you might think they're just putting this on the uh, Orin because they can, but being able to generate imagery uh, using Stable Diffusion is really in quite an interesting thing because if you generate realistic things from nothing, you can use those realistic things to train a model to actually recognize real things, uh, which has been done. In fact, there's a fantastic Electromaker project that does that, and I will try and remember to link to it. I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, if you do know more about this and I've missed the big picture story here, please let me know in the comments. I always feel a little bit dim when I talk about this stuff because it is so complicated, but it is clearly so exciting as well. Um, and of course, we will be plugging the shop list later in the show like we always do, but just in case you are interested in getting an Orin kit or any of the uh, NVIDIA line, um, we sell everything that NVIDIA sell in terms of their embedded stuff in the store, um, including the Orin developer kit, uh, which is everything you would need to get started with this. As I said before, um, make sure that you look at the uh, frameworks that you're working with before you do get some hardware, though. Um, my beautiful Nano that I got as soon as it came out back in the day uh, probably isn't up to speed to do a lot of this kind of stuff, but can still do a surprising amount. But yes, it's a very exciting time for AI on the edge um, and the fact that the generative AIs that are uh, a part of our lives right now are going to be a part of that is going to make things get a lot more interesting a lot quicker than I thought originally uh, and I wonder yeah I wonder if that's true or not I have no idea Ooh, I do find this stuff exciting, but man, I do feel dim whenever I talk about it. I hope uh, this wasn't too cringeworthy for any of you that actually work with this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, do let me know if anyone here, part of the Electromaker community, is working with any of this stuff. I would love to pick your brain about it. Um, as I've said before, I'm in a position where I can take something quite complicated and make it uh, understandable. Um, but this is just a level of complexity that I don't think... It, I'd need years to break this down into something that even I could understand well enough to explain to someone else. Um, which is why it's very difficult when I need to do it as part of my job. If you're enjoying the Electromaker show, it would be handy if you would take a moment to check if you are actually subscribed to the Electromaker YouTube channel. Uh, that subscription uh, bell thing, by the way, uh, is functional. You can hit this little drop down menu here and click all, and this will give you so, uh, um, notifications just up here in the top right corner of YouTube. Um, so here you can see that this particular YouTube channel uh, gets notifications from Electromaker whenever they put up a video. Uh, this is handy if uh, your subscriptions tab over here has hundreds of subscriptions in it. In my case, there's literally thousands there on my main channel. Uh, if you could also click like on this video, that would be very useful. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe is things that YouTubers say for a reason. Uh, that is because YouTube seems to really like it when YouTubers say that, and so I have just said it. Uh, however, um, asking for these things on YouTube is free and it will only take you a moment. However, if you'd rather support us in a more concrete fashion, then by far the best way to do so is by shopping at the Electromaker store. Uh, we stock everything that you will need for any kind of embedded development and also uh, 3D printing supplies. Um, anything you've seen on the show, uh, like the product of the weeks and many of the projects, um, we will stock the things you need to make those. So for example, today we've been talking about NVIDIA. If you want to get your hands on an NVIDIA Jetson Nano or a Xavier or an Orin, we have those in our shop. We stock NVIDIA, we stock Raspberry Pi, we stock everything from Adafruit and uh, SparkFun, for example, Arduino, BeagleBoard, the lot. Um, so if you are wanting to support us. Uh, it is the season, as it were, to start thinking about gifts for Christmas, and everything from quite complex high-end embedded engineering gear through to the very first Arduino kit or Raspberry Pi kit you might get for someone. Uh, yes, do have a look at our store if you do support us. Uh, financially, that is by far the best way that you can support the Electromaker show. And with that out of the way, let's get on with said Electromaker show. <laughs> It is time for Funding Website Things, the part of the show where we talk about things on funding websites, and today we are on Crowdsupply. Now, uh, this is a pre-funding project. We're going to be talking about two. This means it's not available for crowdfunding yet, but it will be soon. It's a bit like when people announce Kickstarters before actually starting them. Crowdsupply is Kickstarter, but just for cool embedded hardware devices. And as you can see, this is the nostalgia bomb for someone like me. Um, I had a second-hand iPod, um, and when it broke, I got an unnamed MP3 player that was actually probably slightly better, but 
but it was not as cool as an iPod. And I was of the generation which went from having nothing like this to having a brick phone and an MP3 player of some kind. Um, I never had a mini disc player, I skipped that one, but I went from Walkman to iPod in about four years in my life, which was kind of interesting. Um, this, yeah, this dial will be very nostalgic for a few people, but Tangara is an ESP32 based development kit based around the idea of a music player. That's enough to get me excited about the project already. I feel like the tagline here is perfect, so I'm not going to try and say it in my own words. Listen to music, audiobooks, and podcasts on a purpose-built device with a tried-and-true form factor, a familiar user interface, and no interest in your data. Or tear it apart and put it back together again. By tweaking our current firmware, you can experiment with alternative user interface patterns, new types of content, tracker-based music production, alarm clock applications, and much more. Or you can design a new faceplate with a different kind of display panel, more physical buttons, speakers, jacks, or a cherry wood enclosure, whatever turns your click wheel. Now, essentially, under the hood, this is an ESP32 with a DAC um, and a uh, SD card slot and a battery management system, which is everything you need for a, uh, a music player. But that's this is the thing that I'm really interested in, this one-touch interface that they've got going here, uh, which is built into the PCB as part of a button and a resistor track, I guess, that tracks your finger position. Um, it's just, yeah, it's it just such a nostalgic input thing. Nothing's had an input quite like the iPod since the iPod. Um, and that's it for now. I'm leaving it at that. If you want to know more about Cool Tech Zone, uh, they are, that's who is making this. You can find out about them at the bottom. Uh, you can enter your email address right here if you are interested in this. If you are me, then you are interested in this. Um, and uh, yeah, the idea of a fully custom MP3 player that is both nostalgic, but uh, a development kit, like the one thing that jumped out to me here is it said, uh, you know, music trackers. You could totally turn this into a music tracker. It might be a bit cumbersome using that one wheel interface to input things like MIDI notes and all that kind of stuff, but there are already various embedded music trackers, uh, tracker creation bits of software out there. So yes, this is definitely one to keep an eye on and definitely one we will be returning to. Now up next is Inkplate, and yes, we've talked about a lot of different ink plates on the show, but that's because Solder just keep making more and more interesting kinds of e-paper displays. And this one is very simple. It's a grayscale display, but it is fast. How fast? Well, any, every single one of these videos, as someone who's interested in e-ink displays, excites me. Um, I've never seen one quite as fast as this. Um, and uh, the text one is the one that really got me. One of my big dreams is to make a little embedded device that is very simple. All it does is it has a keyboard and it has an e-ink display. It uses almost no power and it will save whatever text I put into it onto a little EEPROM or something. That's something I've wanted to build forever, but you can't because e-ink displays do not update quick enough. Well, look at this. There are many, many demos that are exciting on this, like uh, rendering grayscale, grayscale images almost immediately. Um, the same thing with text, but with absolutely tiny text, so uh, showing incredible pixel density. Um, this is soldered. By this point, if you've been watching the show for a while, you kind of know what you're getting into with an ink plate. They are ESP32 development kits. Uh, one side is an ESP32 and a bunch of useful I.O., um, and the other side is the screen. Um, and you can uh, use the Arduino IDE to program them. I think they also have MicroPython support now yeah they have a they have a micro python support as well um so they're incredibly easy to program um and they are incredibly quick as you can see with this one uh, partial updates of this speed are just wild to me as i said before though i i've watched this video over and over several times my dream has been to build a small terminal with an e-ink display forever this is the thing that's going to help me do that there are a few companies out there putting really nice e-ink uh, development kits out. Um, but the reason we end up talking about Soldered every time they put something out isn't because they ask us to. Um, I found this just today randomly off my own back. Um, but every single time they put one out, I just think they're just such wonderful ideas. They're really well put together. They're usually not all ex that expensive either. But as before, this is a pre-launch project. There's no price on it just yet. Um, and I don't know how much more it will cost than the originals. For example, the Inkplate 6, um, there was various versions of it, but that went out for $109 for a fully assembled kit or $130 for one in a frame. Um, can you get cheaper e-ink displays by themselves? Absolutely, but they're not attached to an ESP32 and they're not uh, with the fantastic uh, software support that you get with Solid as well. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. Uh, again, this is one that we'll come back to, but if you're after an 11 uh, FPS refresh rate e-ink display, you can stick your email address in the box just here. <laughs>
Now, last week's product of the week was the Zhao range of microcontrollers. Not just one product, but several. Um, and as I've said many times before, I love this. This is the uh, NRF52840 Sense version of it. Um, but there's different versions. There's one with an RP2040 in it. There's one with a SAMD21 in it. I said 51 for the entirety of last week, but I'm pretty sure it is the 21. Um, and uh, yes, there's various uh, various ones. And if you'd like to find out more about it, you can head to the uh, link in the description. This is where you'll find Robin talking about them all. And they're all things that we stock on our online store as well. If you you want to head to electromaker.io slash shop you can find them however on last week's show i did start a contest uh, that you could win them and it is now time to uh, announce the winner of all four of the Zhao boards we are giving away so up first, the winner of the Zhao NRF52840 is I Akash Paul, who says, going to try and build a clock 2 clock with an I2C LED strip with Python instead of C with the hashtag Zhao. Um, winning the same board but the Sense variant, the Zhao NRF52840 Sense, is uh, Embedded Geek, who says they would try to make a massive custom 16-channel relay controlled by the Zhao. This can be used as a centralized relay control device in a smart home, which is a really cool idea. Third, winning the NRF, sorry, the Zhao RP2040, which is the Raspberry Pi RP2040 variant of it, is Joey Suzu2519, who says, I think I'd make a wearable, love the show and Ian's quirks. Thank you very much. I'm glad you call them quirks. Uh, other people call them uh, errors. <laughs> And finally, winning the uh, Zhao Sam D21 variant is CamPlays487, who says, I'd make a mini home automation hub for closet or bathroom. All four of you have won these Zhao boards. Congratulations. We will be in, be in touch with you as to how we can get each one of them out to you. And to everyone else who entered, thank you very much for doing so. And there's another contest that you can enter in just a moment. And that is because the Blues Scoop is the latest product of the week. Now, if Scoop is familiar to you, that's because I was talking about it just a few weeks ago. In fact, I happen to have one of them right here. Scoop is a lithium ion capacitor on a uh, little PCB with some JST connectors, which doesn't sound like much, but it's actually one of the more exciting little additions that you could make to any IoT setup because lithium ion capacitors have a bunch of really interesting properties. Now, as always, Robin can give you the full rundown, but if I was going to be very brief about what makes this awesome, it can hold a phenomenal amount of charge for a very, very long time without self-discharging, which is what lithium-ion batteries do, and you can use it in a much higher range of temperatures. So if you have a device that is somewhere quite hot or somewhere quite cold, you can use this as your backup power supply. But it is that. It is a backup power supply. I'm sure you could work out some insanely low-powered thing that could run off this for years, but what you really want this for is when your mains connected device or bigger battery-powered connected device somehow loses power, you want this to kick in and keep it running long enough to send a warning message out. Uh, this thing will reportedly keep uh, a Blues Wireless kit, which, uh, by the way, we have more Blues Wireless things coming soon. I have one uh, out of reach on my desk, um, but it will keep a full Blues Wireless kit, a cellular IoT kit running for a few hours after a power outage, um, which makes them pretty cool. And the one thing that most people say when you talk about this, and you say, yeah, this is a 250 farad capacitor, they say, you mean microfarad, right? No, 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 this is 250 farads. Anyway, I implore you to actually uh, watch Robin talk about this rather than me and read the fantastic article that goes along with it. As I've said, ad nauseum, Robin is actually an engineer. He does know what he's talking about. I am just an idiot in an attic who is very enthusiastic. There is definitely a difference there. However, as this is a product of the week, we are also going to be giving one away. And you know exactly how that works by now. Electromaker competitions are very simple and very fair. We pick a winner at random, and all you have to do to be entered into this competition is be subscribed to this YouTube channel and leave a comment on this video saying what you would do if you won the scoop. And then under that, just leave the hashtag, uh, hashtag scoop. So hashtag S-C-O-O-P, all one word, no spaces, nothing like that. And that means we can just find all of the entries easily and choose somebody at random to win the prize, which will be announced on next week's show. But yes, the Scoop is a very fun little device. I, uh, When I was messing around with it, when I first got my hands on one, I was testing it with this little uh, Adafruit. What is, what is the chip on this even? Is an ESP32? Oh, okay, just ESP32, Room32. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, this little uh, Hazard board. Um, really just seeing what it would be like as a power source. Haven't done any real tests on it, but that will be coming soon. Um, in fact, if you are interested in this and other products that Blues come out, keep your eyes on this channel. There's going to be some Blues content coming out soon. I know we talked about Blues, who uh, previously called Blues Wireless a bit in the past, and there's some fantastic projects on our project hub, but there is more coming quite soon, which is going to be quite exciting. <laughs> 
We're going to close out this week's show by talking about three projects on the Electromaker Project Hub. Very different projects, but all of them wonderful in their own ways. And just a very quick reminder, we give away prizes at the end of every month for people who put projects up on the Project Hub. We have an independent panel of judges that take all of the projects from a month and pick three winners to win cash prizes of $150, $100, and $50. And all three winners also win a tidy pile of Electromaker swag like pens and stickers and things like that as well. So the first project we're going to look at is a remote control car using a wireless development board. And we've seen many of those, but one of the things I like about this is that it really is a from scratch DIY project. So you can see above my head here the car, um, and it is a piece of acrylic uh, with a PCB on it and some batteries and some motors underneath it. And it really is as simple as that. In fact, these uh, motor housings are just uh, glued to the piece of acrylic. There really is no barrier for entry to this. You wouldn't necessarily even need to use a piece of acrylic, I suppose. You could use a piece of wood. The idea is that these are all simple and cheap and easy to get parts, and the circuitry as well is as simplistic as possible. Now, there is a fantastic build video attached to this uh, tutorial as well, but I just want to skip to the point where you can see the car moving. Because uh, the way this works is there's an ESP32 development kit on board, and then you just attach to it as a Wi-Fi access point, and then you can control the car. And as you can see, there's not that much in the way of latency, and it moves around quite well. It uh, has uh, all four wheels drive, but of course uh, you've got it programmed so that they steer in different ways. And for something this simplistic, it has, yeah, the latency was the thing that, uh, that I found the most exciting about this. Now, low latency aside, the other thing that's wonderful about it is just that these are all cheap and easily available parts. These motors, or variants of them, are available for cheap. A lot of them come in starter kits, um, and the ESP8266 as a development board is incredibly cheap as well. It always has been, and it's been completely superseded by ESP32s and a million other things, but you can still get them for just a few dollars on AliExpress. Other than that, there's not much. There's a power regulating MOSFET and an L9, uh, L293D, which is one of many motor control chips, and then a simple piece of per board and as mentioned before uh, you'd simply stick these to the acrylic it's just wonderfully simple you could have over engineered that but no it just works the way that it works and it's just a really nice idea so if you're interested in following this step-by-step -step tutorial, as mentioned, there are lots of wonderful images and step-by-step -step guides in the text. Um, and all of these images are taken from the video, which should give you some idea as to the quality of the video production. It really is a fantastic production. And this is a, a project from DIY Projects Lab, who's put a bunch of fantastic projects up on the Electromaker Projects page. Um, you can uh, head to their uh, um, uh, page to find various uh, other ones, which are all equally well documented. Um, so yes, uh, this is a fantastic project. I thought it was definitely worth mentioning because, as I've said many times before, things don't have to be super complicated to be really good. If something is well documented, it could be a simple project, and this is going to definitely help other people who are just getting into the hobby. Now, taking simple components and making it into something complex like a remote control car is one thing. This project takes the opposite approach, which takes an incredibly complicated concept like Edge AI and puts it into something relatively simple like a remote control. Uh, this is a gesture-based remote control device which uses a Silicon Labs development kit and an absolutely tiny model uh, which has been trained using Newton's online platform to uh, make it into a gesture remote which will uh, pick up a bunch of different hand gestures and send it via a USB HID over to a computer. Now, if you like to get into the nitty gritty of Edge AI, this might be uh, uh, interesting to you. Uh, things like how much the uh, f footprint the flash uses. It's uh, sorry, how much footprint it uses on the flash. It's only 4.2 kilobytes worth of flash it uses, and, and 1.4 kilobytes of SRAM for the uh, everything signal processing, inference engine, and the model all together. To me, that is wild. Um, I don't understand how you can make AI work with such tiny amounts of space, but it's what Newton seems to specialize in. They create incredibly small models. Famously, they even have deployed. AI models onto an Arduino Uno, which I don't understand how that is possible, but it, it is a thing that is there. There's a great introduction video here that is definitely worth watching, takes you through it step by step. It also talks about the hardware, which is the uh, Silicon Labs uh, XG24 development kit. I have no hands-on experience of this one. Um, I, I haven't even used Simplicity Studio, which is Silicon Labs' own IDE, and they have a software development kit, which obviously you can use to set up uh, separately. Um, but if you are interested in this and have access to the hardware, this entire project is up on GitHub. Uh, you can clone the project from there and follow the instructions. The instructions are here on the GitHub. They're also here on the Electromaker project page. Um, every time I see a project with Newton AI, it just seems such a tidy and compact way of working with AI on very, very small devices. And uh, yeah, I do hope that you give it a look. And if you do have access to one of these devices, please give it a go and let me know in the comments how you get on.
And finally this week, CLN17, a closed loop driver for the NEMA 17 stepper motor variety. Uh, now this is a really nice project. It's, it's a project that's gone through several iterations. It is an open source project. Um, the creator, Cree Punk, is uh, actively looking for people to get involved and help with the development of it. And the story here, as it says, it's uh, an affordable open source compact high performance closed loop stepper motor driver specifically for NEMA 17 form factor motors. Um, the $15 bill of materials is obviously something that is really uh, quite nice and just the way that it all fits together looks great as well. Um, the video uh, introducing it is short, to the point, and says exactly what it is all about. Uh, the website as well is just absolutely wonderful. Now, if you would like to know more about it in general, um, there is a fantastic breakdown here on the Electromaker project page. Um, the, app, the very simple cliff notes of it is that the running the show here is uh, one of the STM32G4 chips, um, which are STM32's uh, flagship chips for motor control. That's specifically what they are designed for. Um, but there's a bunch of other nice little quality of life things here as well. Um, but yeah, if you really do want to find out more about it, you can head to the uh, project page just here. Right up at the top of the project page, there's a link out to the project website and they also have a Discord server, um, but it's just really wonderfully put together. I liked the idea of this project when I first saw it. I liked the video, and then I saw all of these images and the amount of love and care that's gone into uh, just describing things like, yeah, for example, the STM32G4. This is telling you exactly what all of the pin functions do. This is useful even outside of the project. This is really wonderful. Um, and if you look at the website, you realize, yeah, okay, there's there's a huge amount here. There's a project overview, exploded uh, shots of all of it. Um, and this is the third iteration or fourth iteration, I think, of this device. So if you are interested in getting involved in what looks like a really interesting open source project for a very specific need, which is working with NEMA 17 stepper motors, this is exactly the kind of thing for you. Um, I, 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 yeah, I really love this. I wish it was something that I had the knowledge to contribute to, but I don't. And I'm not a design person either. Um, but if you are interested in finding out more, do head to the link in the description. And as I said before, at the top of this um, uh, project page, there's also a link out to the project website. And uh, at very least, I uh, say you should come and look at this video because it introduces the project quite wonderfully. <laughs> That was our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for all the support that you continue to show us, uh, whether that's doing the whole clicking like thing on YouTube or what, from buying stuff from the shop. Uh, and I know a lot of people uh, watch the show who also listen to the podcast um, and I've had some lovely feedback on the podcast as well. I'm so glad so many of you are uh, still enjoying this in audio format. On the off chance you didn't know, this show goes out as a podcast, exactly as it is. Uh, there's a different intro and outro, but all of the content from the show is literally the same audio as the YouTube show. And I have been told by many that it still works rather well. Um, which in, in some ways is a compliment and in other ways makes me think that I speak a lot more than I should for what is ostensibly a visual medium. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope you have enjoyed this show. I will be back with you next week with far more interesting things to talk about from the embedded and maker sphere. I hope you have a fun, safe and creative week and I'll chat to you soon.